This is Pushing Boundaries Together, a podcast where we speak with leading scientists and engineers about their amazing applications that are pushing their fields forward to modern frontiers. For 50 years, PI has aimed to explore technology and science's most grueling challenges and have provided refined motion solutions that push the boundaries of astronomy, advanced manufacturing, and medicine. I'm Dave Rigo, president of PIUSA and host of Pushing Boundaries Together. Today we speak with Christopher Mandillo, research professor at UMass Lowell and amazing astronomer. Hi, my name is Christopher Mandillo. I'm a research professor at UMass Lowell, and I work on the Picture C project, which is a NASA suborbital high altitude balloon to do direct exoplanetary imaging. He's here to talk about his most recent success, launching and controlling a telescope from a research balloon 25 miles above the Earth. About his dedicated team that worked for five years designing, integrating, and testing, what happens when a falling payload hits a mountain, and how he used a single PI hexapod to save his project millions of dollars. Chris first approached me about using one of his hexapods in quite a unique way. You know, you wanted to, to fly one of our hexapods, and I, I got a little nervous, <laughs> to be honest. But it, it sounds like it worked fine and it was a successful launch. So I feel like research balloons and just that whole technology is overshadowed by rockets. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, the U.S. sent up a lot of research balloons and even manned as well. It's one of those really interesting pieces of Americana that's, that's not really mentioned. So I thought it would be great to hear from someone who worked on that project with cool technology and what we are going to call the you know newly formed podcast is pushing boundaries together. I think this fits really well because it seems to me like you took on a lot of risk modifying what you needed to modify to make it to make the system work in the environment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean going to your your first point about doing this from a smaller platform it, it definitely it's definitely true that it's hard to get noticed doing suborbital missions. So we we've flown your your stuff on a couple of sounding rockets and now on a balloon. This is the first time flying a hexapod. Yeah, the challenges were, well, we didn't see it as being a huge challenge. We saw that you had a, a vacuum compliant device, the 811 hexapod, the small one. We got the idea, we, we had built a, a sounding rocket telescope with a secondary mirror that we could never get to stay in focus because of all the thermal deformation and issues you have launching a sounding rocket. It get, tends to get really hot. And the secondary mirror mount was like, the exact same size as your hexapod. And we always kept saying, man, it'd be great if we could get a hexapod in there and just fix all this. Um, ah, but we didn't, get a, we didn't get a chance to do it with the sounding rocket. And it probably would have taken too much time. And the sounding rocket, you only have five minutes or so in space. I see. So when we got the chance to do, do the balloon, it seemed like the obvious choice. Right. So we saw you know, that there was a vacuum compatible device. The big issue for us was the temperature. I think the device is rated down to zero Celsius and it being it's the mount for our secondary mirror, which is out at the the end of the telescope structure, which is about eight feet away from the the center. And it's definitely the coldest part of the telescope. Okay, as with a precision mechanical system that has tight tolerances, hexapods can stop moving when they get too cold due to deformations of their precision mechanics. Chris's team knew that at 120,000 feet high, temperature would not only deform their telescope, but it could also lock up the hexapod. Instead of giving up, they thought about the issue with a lot of creativity, and although they realized they couldn't keep a stable temperature across the entire balloon to counteract any thermal deformation, they could afford to maintain the hexapod's temperature. This approach allowed their structure made of aluminum instead of costly carbon fiber to contract, and this is where the hexapod's role came into the picture. Okay. Uh, it, got, it got down to minus 50 degrees C towards the end of our flight out there. So we knew that was going to be a challenge. We decided to just use heaters to, to keep the, the motors on the six legs warm and at room temperature. And that seemed to work very well. The hexapod ran all night with no problems. We got a, these capped on two by two inch 20 watt heaters. Oh. And, and they have an adhesive on them. We, we glued them on and, and did some epoxying around the edges to make sure they wouldn't peel off. You know, we had to come up with something. We were either going to do that or just epoxy on some sort of larger resistive heaters. But it seemed the natural thing to kind of glue these flat 
flexible heaters onto this round leg. Right. Right. And we, we did some testing. We, you know, we, we didn't really thermovac that at all, actually. We did the whole instrument and the electronics for the instrument. So we thermovac tested your controller for that hexapod, but we tested it at air and, and we assumed it would work and it did. Yeah. And I think yeah. I heard that you used a lot of silicone to plug the boards. And uh, yeah, that's, that's our yeah. typical approach. Just fill yeah. everything with, with glue. Yeah, right. Uh, and it, it won't know it's in space. Obviously, the, the TVAC testing is, is really important for any aerospace environment. Now, is that something that you do there in, at UMass Lowell, or did you have the travel to get that done? Yeah, no, we do, we do it here in our lab. We, we have a huge, okay. yeah, we have a big nice. um, vacuum chamber. We have a couple chambers that we can use. And yep. it's, you know, it's a university setting. We, we build everything ourselves typically. So yep. we don't have like an off the shelf TVAC chamber. We, we have a big vacuum chamber because we have a, a pretty large ultraviolet instrument calibration facility here in our lab. So we have a large tank that we use and, and our group grew up doing rocket ultraviolet experiments. So vacuum systems are, you know, close to us. So we, we, we just modify what we have to do the test. A project with as many unknowns as this one needs to involve a dedicated and talented team who are invested in the mission. I wanted to know more about who helped Chris succeed with this project. Sure, yeah. Um, I work with two other professors who are full professors. I, I, I am newly a research professor here. So there's Supriya Chakrabarty, who is the, the PI for the mission, for the picture mission, and then Tim Cook, who is a another professor here who I've worked with for the last 15 years. The, the three of us came from Boston University. I started my, my PhD program there in 2005, and it took eight or so years to finish. And in the process of finishing, Tim and Supriya moved to UMass Lowell. And then when I finished up, I followed them here. So I was a postdoc here and, and now research professor. Congratulations. The, the team, uh, thank you. The team we have is is very small. So it's uh, the three of us. And then we have a mechanical engineer, uh, Jason Martel, uh, who is also at BU with us and, and is now here. And we had two main grad students working on this project. That was Glenn Howe and Kuravi Hewawasam. Uh, both of those guys just defended their PhDs. So this, this project came to an end and, and they were able to finally start writing and uh, finished their dissertations and they both defended in the last few months so they're now both doctors so you know that's that's sort of the initiative here at a university doing these missions is not only to just do science it's to you know push people's careers forward and, and get early career scientists into the pipeline and, and with lots of good hardware experience stefan vondron is is on as well and i i asked him to chime in yeah, I, I have a question regarding the, the heat. Did that have any, you generated the heat to keep the, the legs apart, uh, legs warm enough? Did that have any influence on your cameras and your, your other sensors on the experiment? Yeah, it, it, it probably does. And we did a fairly decent job controlling the temperature on the hexapod legs. Like I said, we didn't do a tremendous amount of cold testing on that unit before we flew it. That's sort of the way things go with suborbital. You know, you test as much as you can, but we don't have the budget like a satellite has a has a budget to do all this and the, you know, right. requirements yeah. to do all this testing beforehand. So we, we use our best judgment to decide what's gonna work and what to test during flight. And our and our first flight was a was a test flight. It wasn't designed to do science. So I, I imagine we did have some impact on the focus of the telescope due to the heaters on the hexapod. But we have a number of layers of what we call wavefront control in our instrument. It's an instrument to, to do direct imaging of exoplanets. And the name of the game there is to try and block out all of the starlight to a part in a billion or so, so that you can see a very, very dim planet sitting next to it. And then in order to do that, you need to maintain a quality of the the wavefront of, of the light coming from the star going through your optics to an extremely high uh, precision. Yeah. So we have after the hexapod, sort of the first level of that system. It's the most coarse adjustment that we have just to align the telescope. And it runs very slowly. And then uh, beyond that, the next stage is a very fast, deformable mirror that has a sensor that runs at 400 to 1000 hertz. So that's 
making corrections up to a thousand times per second. So small drifts of the hexapod would be just canceled out by that by that optic. So we didn't worry about it too much. Um, I think we can do a lot better. We had some oscillations in the temperature of about a plus or minus a degree Celsius on the hexapod. And I think we can do better than that. I think it, it, we, we need to tune up our control parameters a bit on the heaters. For the most part, it, it stayed locked at, at 20C for the whole flight. Yeah, it's a great solution. Not too much of added equipment, mass, weight, anything. Right. And yeah, get the job done. It's excellent. 25 miles above the Earth seems far from home. Although it isn't considered low Earth orbit where many satellites are found, and there is still atmospheric turbulence that affects image quality. I wanted to get a sense for how research balloons could play a future role in improving the field of astronomy compared to ground-based telescopes. We consider ourselves much closer to the space side of things than the ground-based side of things. At that altitude, you are above 99.9% of the atmosphere. The ambient pressure there is about one tor, and on the ground it's 746 or whatever it is, so it's almost a part in a thousand. We're definitely much closer to the the, the space regime, but we, we're watching the telescope fly in real time on a camera, and there's still wind. You can still see <laughs> yeah. impacts of, of wind on the telescope during ascent and and at times during during the night. So it's it's even though it's very very low, there are still some disturbances from ambient air. Okay. Um, so you, you're definitely not. There's still something there. How stable is the telescope? You know, with this wind, I mean, do you have sensors on board that are, that are measuring the angular motion of? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And and yeah. and how do you compensate I mean, the, for that if you do it all? So the the main component there is this the the pointing system for the telescope, which is called WASP, which is developed by NASA. It's the, it stands for Wallops Arc Second Pointer, and that's a, a gimbal frame mount. It's, it can it can hold like two thousand pounds. It's a it's a big mount that we attach our telescope to. And there's a whole huge team at, at NASA Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia that developed that. And it can, it can point the telescope and it has, it has its own gyroscopes and cameras and everything. And it can do sub arc second level pointing of the telescope. And then there's a, a rotation stage above the whole gondola that can sort of control your azimuthal angle. If you, if you okay. want to call it that, you're you yeah. just if you need to rotate around and and look left or right, it can do large changes, um, and that's how we can track objects all night or point to different parts of the sky. Right. And then the WASP system does very small changes in in altitude yeah. and in azimuth. And I imagine you know, it's pretty expensive, <laughs> so you want to try uh, to get as many images as possible. You want to get as many images as possible. <laughs> I mean, once you buy the balloon, as they say, right, right, there's very little expense once you take it out of the box you're pretty much at the end of your budget there and they just let it go. And then, you know, then yeah, it'd be much, much, a much better return on investment if you could stay up a lot longer and you can, but not from Fort Sumner, New Mexico, which is where all, you know, first pay first flights have to fly from. Okay. Um, Okay. It's the facility where they have the best control over the environment there and they understand it and they have a good base set up there. They have more remote locations around the globe for doing longer duration flights, like in Antarctica. Do you recover the, the payload? Does it get recovered? Yeah, yeah. Do you lose it? Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah, the whole the whole payload is picked up by a, we have a parachute in line. That's kind of the most amazing part. When they want to bring the balloon down, they, they can predict which way it's going, and then they pick an area where they know. If, when they push a button, uh, it just immediately breaks the connection between the balloon and the parachute. So then the parachute and the whole payload start free falling. And then a big like rip goes up the side of the balloon to rapidly deflate the balloon so that it'll it'll fall down as well. It has this like rip stitch built into the side of the balloon, and and they just have it all timed out and, and modeled where they can you know push the button and then it falls for uh, over an hour. They can guess pretty well where it's going to land and it's moving. I mean, once the parachute opens, it starts drifting pretty fast. If you land, you can land out in Utah in the mountains, and that's not great. Uh, we saw one payload that hit a big tree on the way down and like broke its telescope mount off. And then if it's somewhere really remote, it can take the team a long time to go get it. And then it could get rained on and things like that. But ours landed in a field by a highway and they picked it up like a few hours after it landed and got it back that night. And it came back without a scratch on it. 
to the point where we could have just plugged it back in and, and gone and flown it again the next day had we been able to. It was it was remarkable. Yeah, and, and I, yeah. Got, I, got a, I got the sense that it's pretty you know irregular to get that that nice of a landing. So mm. we were very lucky. And so happy. when are you gonna send it back up? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> ask uh, ask Mr. Coronavirus. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I must be limiting it. But I mean, yeah. did you have plans for that? Uh, to, yeah. To, okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. We were supposed to be there right now. Okay. Um, uh, we so, we had yeah. planned to fly again this September. And we would have been there right now. Uh, we would have delivered right now, and we would have been getting ready to launch again. So it's unclear when we'll be able to launch again. I didn't tell you the the like the best hexapod story <laughs> of, of the flight. And you were <laughs> okay. and we, we got we were moving around it, but we didn't get there. So we after we launched, and we get up and we get up to altitude, and it's still daytime, and we're we're going to start commissioning the telescope and and. It's in this latched configuration so that it can't swing around. So they, the, the, this is the WASP team, the pointing team, the NASA guys. They like unlock the telescope and they start pointing it around. And we're getting all our cameras up and running while they're doing that. And they say, okay, let's go, let's go look at a star. So they slew us around. So before this point on the ground, we've done a number of alignment checks. So we have to like check that, that their camera that sees the stars is aligned to our telescope. And we, do that with the yellow lights and all these, you know, metrology machines to, to make sure we, you know, we've got that aligned so that when we go up and look at a star, we're actually, we actually see it. But we know there's going to be some like deformation of the system because again, it's going to get cold and we're not really sure how bad it's going to be. So we go up and we look at a star and we turn on our camera and we don't see anything. And we're sitting there going, okay, all right, let's go through like our checklist of what we're supposed to do. And we're thinking, it's like getting ready to start like maneuvering or doing like a spiral search or something. And and I thought, okay, hold on, let's just let's check the temperature because it's not. I I had just been thinking, okay, we just launched, like it's not. It's only been a couple hours, like it's not going to be that cold. But yeah. I look look at the temperature data, and we're already like minus thirty degrees Celsius in the telescope. <laughs> wow. And I go, oh, all right. I had a plan for this, and the plan was. Take that number and multiply by the CTE of aluminum, okay. and I just do this on a like literally on the back of an envelope, and come up. Oh man, the telescope is two and a half millimeters shorter than it used to be on the ground. So I send uh-huh. up. All right, move yeah. the hexapod. Move the hexapod two and a half millimeters in Z to to put it back to where it would have been on the ground. And I send the command, and all these noises happen as you send the command up, and it gets relayed up there. And then all of a sudden, on the screen, where uh, you're seeing our camera live. You don't see anything, and then this circle of light that is the star goes down to a point, and you see cool. this perfectly in focus bright star in the middle of wow. our camera. And I go, "Ah, oh, okay, there it is." <laughs> That's so awesome. So everything was aligned and and uh, and working great, and we didn't uh, we didn't mess ourselves up by going and looking for a star that wasn't in focus. So that was the first the first moment we knew the hexapod was working really well. That's great. Yeah, every part of it worked, and we're not because you know, we've gone through two rocket launches of of the previous iterations of picture, where immediately something went wrong after after flight. On our first launch, the radios uh, that that were sending our data back broke a few oh. seconds after we launched, so it was oh. just clear from the from the beginning we weren't going to get any data. Yeah, uh, so we we're basically tough. flying a dead payload. So that was no fun. Mm-hmm. After five years, that was my uh, that was my dissertation. Uh-huh. Um, Sorry. And then the second one, <laughs> yeah. I, our telescope was like drifting out of focus as we were fighting with it to get get the wavefront control system locked up. So we got a lot closer in the second one. And then the third one, we had an issue, and we we're like, "Oh God! Like we can't, we can't, you know, get through this whole thing without, get, you know, getting something done again." And and then it locked, and everything was working perfectly for you know five six minutes, and that was the kind of moment we realized, "All right, we finally built something that worked." <laughs> I just imagine all the anticipation, all the years of research, design, building the system, experimenting, and then first using a sounding rocket without much success. Finally, on the airfield, with the sun setting, you look across your thousand foot balloon as you prepare for it to finally launch. Of course, getting it into the air is only one challenge. Plenty can still go wrong after it finally rises, but that's probably not on your mind as you pray that the launch goes smoothly. Yeah, it's it's a very strange experience to launch something that you've been in the same room with for the last five years. 
yeah. you know, four years. <laughs> it's been hardware that you've just been touching and, and con- making connections on. It's a very personal, like tactile uh, connection you develop with this, this instrument and this machine that you're like always working on and, and doing every single little bit on, you know, building all the wiring and tying everything down. And mm. then you just let it go. And then you and let it go. So far yeah. away from you. <laughs> like, what is it? Is it going to work? I've never, never seen it work when I wasn't standing next to it. Is it going to work? Yeah. I, I think every, every parent has that time in their life when, for me, it was my, my first son. He had a balloon. We were outside at like a, an event or something. He had a balloon and somehow yeah. it let go, you know, and he was looking at yeah. that thing flying away and he was so upset. You didn't want that thing to, to, to go. And, you know, and you couldn't really console him yeah. because he was attached to it, you know, <laughs> and you and that's, that's essentially right. what you what you that's really right. did. You know, Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, Chris, I appreciate, you know, your time and, you know, really good to to just talk about oh, yeah. a project well, like this you know we're gonna keep uh you know we've got a hexapod in the proposal that we're running right oh, now. is that so right we'll, oh we'll, awesome awesome yeah we'll keep using the keep using the stuff yeah that's great yeah it, it, it worked for us great i mean we started we, we flew some of your piezos on on the sounding rocket going going back and those worked great we were we always go to you guys whenever we have some robotic super precise thing we need to do awesome Cool work, man. Thank you for listening to Pushing Boundaries Together. This podcast is brought to you thanks to PI Physique Instrumenta, a global designer and manufacturer of nanometer precision motion systems, performance automation products, and piezo technology solutions. At PI, our goal is to push the boundaries together with scientists and engineers to help realize their missions with the precision required for greatness. Visit pi-usa.us for more information.